square mesh size, okay? And anything above that is what we call macro corner. And again, in your essays, when we were talking about sampling, a lot of you concentrated on just that sediment sample. But I said to you that, yes, that's one group of organisms, but in that kind of sampling, we're not collecting fish, we're not collecting sharks, whales, we're not collecting starfish, sea urchins, and so on. So there were a lot more organisms out there that you could have talked about in terms of sampling. And that you were supposed to do that reading, remember? Anyhow, macro fauna then would be any organisms that, that are retained on that 0.5 millimeter mesh size. But remember, there are all other organisms flying, uh, swimming around that will not be trapped in that sediment. So basically, when we talk about benthic macro fauna, we're talking about organisms that are larger than 0.5 millimeter. So they may be as tiny as little crab or, or shrimp that you found. They might be a huge fish, it might be a lobster, it might be a crab. So I need you, when you are thinking about your essays, and this is quite important for final exams, think, remember I suggested about thinking outside the box? So the ben these macrobenthic organisms can be as big as a, a whale, okay? As big as a dolphin. So you need to think about those organisms, but we are not sampling. The ground we use will not sample for those kinds of organisms. And some of you did mention in your essays that you can use um, submarines, you can use scuba dive, you can use quadrats. And that's the kind of essay that was needed. That's the information that you needed to develop for that essay to get full marks. Okay? Because it was very open, the topic was very open about biological sampling. How do you sample for any of these organisms that live in the sea? The myofauna are going to be smaller, they're going to be organisms that are retained between a 0.5 and a 0.062 or, and now you remember the 0.062, that's the mesh size of the plankton net. So if we use that net and we pass, we try to pass that sediment through it, okay, we would be getting organisms that are 0.5, what we call the myofauna organisms. Now, unfortunately, uh, not unfortunately, but we can't really use that kind of mesh for that kind of sampling. And I will tell you why when we talk a little bit about myofauna. Um, I'm going to take about 10 minutes of this lecture and talk about myofauna. But basically, it's, it's going to be so many organisms per little cell, like just like the five plant on counters that you had to use. It's going to be millions, so that's actually, we don't collect it with a graph. We collect for myofauna samples, we collect with a tiny, like a syringe, because there are lots more organisms per, you know, that sort of, you know, less than millimeter um, square that we sell. And the microfauna will be anything smaller than that. And we talked about microfauna when we were talking about the phytoplankton and diatoms and so on. So benthic organisms can live either in the sediment, as I mentioned, or on the sediment. Epifauna and infauna, or sometimes it's called endofauna. But it's infaunal organisms as opposed to epifaunal organisms. Um, a number of organisms, different belonging to different taxonomic groups, invertebrates, vertebrates, plants. That's why we keep talking about benthic organisms. We don't only talk about benthic fauna because on the sediment, you will get some microflora, you may get some algae, okay? So it's fauna and flora. And these organisms are very important because, as you saw from your sampling, they are collected in particular locations. So you did different samples, um, you did three sets of samples, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, and so on. So what we are hopefully going to get is a nice description of which organisms are present in which particular area. And based on your observations, because we didn't really do any kind of physical chemical, uh, sorry, we did do the water quality parameters, but we didn't do any chemical analysis to the of sediment. Now, if we did, that would actually give us a um, much more improved picture because those results are going to complement what we call the living conditions or it's going to actually um, characterize the living conditions and environment under which these organisms are living. And they are going to be different. 
And that's why benthic organisms are considered to be quite important because they're very good um, indicators of the environmental conditions or environmental parameters. And that's why we are, you will see that why we are, some of us get so excited when we talk about them. They are also at the base of the food chain. We did say that the phytoplankton cells, and you saw why, because with their uh, photosynthetic, there's a lot of um, the copepods and the zooplankton so feed on them, but they, um, so they're in the water, they're in the water column as it were, and they are the base of the food chain as well, but at a slightly, at a higher level, the benthic organism, where you have, so those benthic, but you have, you have no copies on the site anyhow, right? It's, it's, it must be the, um, the actual bulb is gone, and that's gonna take too long for us to change. Um, so these, these benthic organisms are good integrators of what is happening in the environment. And that's why they actually become very important when you're doing environmental impact assessments, for example. Um, some of you are aware that there are a lot of environmental companies. They do it for um, descriptions of the environment, the green environment especially. They actually go out and they will, just like you, they will sample the benthic organisms. And the reason they sample the benthic organisms is that they can tell or they can describe that particular environment at that particular time and then it can also tell you things like um, whether there's when you do the sort of sediment chemistry you, it will tell you the things like levels of contaminants levels of hydrocarbons and so on so if there is an oil spill for example you can then do those very same sampling measurements and so on collecting the benthic sediment samples. You can do it, let's say, you know, we sample with the grab. Um, if we had to sample coral reef, somebody, some people, students talked about it in their lecture. How would we sample a coral reef? If we wanted to find out what was living there, because that's what we call a hard benthic environment, is a coral reef, because it's on the bottom, okay? And we want to find out what's living there. So we haven't done it yet, but how would we sample it? just from thinking about it. When we say sampling, we want to find out which organisms are living there, how they're living there, some conditions. So how would we sample the coral reef? Because we don't want to go digging up, and we don't want to go grabbing and taking cores. So how would we do it? Uh, right, exactly. So we'll be doing things like, we may, we may have somebody going, who might go scuba diving, you might go um, snorkeling, you go with a camera, video camera, you may do a um, quad drive. So you do the same, um, the same, you use the same, let's say, methods of sampling, because you may want to do a line transect, you may want to do a quad drive, but you are doing it in situ and you are not, it's what you call non destructive sampling. Okay? Now we did destructive sampling because we brought back the sediment, but we know we're not sort of killing too many organisms. But really, you, we are encouraged to do uh, non-destructive sampling because we go to the reef, but we don't want to sort of pull fish, we don't want to stun the fish, we don't want to dig up bits of coral. We want to do non-destructive sampling. We want to see what's there. But of course, in the interest of science, very often you have to collect these organisms, so you will have to set traps, you will have to go fishing and things like that. There is the scenes, some people mentioned the use of scenes and so on. So there are those types of sampling and for different types of environment. What about if we wanted to sample the benthic macrofauna? And the reason I'm asking you these things is I need you to again make the connection with the different lectures. You have to make the connection. So we haven't done mangroves yet, but there, there is what you call a benthic habitat of the work in mangrove roots, for example. Now how would we sample that? We can't go with a grab. We can do some videos and some cam uh, camera shots, but what else can we do? If we want to sample this, that sort of um, substrate, which is what we could get the roots, let's say, of the mangrove tree, how would we sample it? No ideas? No ideas? You are not waking up this morning. 
Well, these roots, um, as you will uh, see when we get to the lectures, they are when you pass in the swamp, they're often in sediment, and sometimes with the low tide they get exposed. So you can go when it's on a low tide, you can do your pictures, you can actually scrape some of the oysters and barnacles and so off of them. So you can do some destructive sampling as well as non-destructive sampling. You can do experiments out there. So there are different ways. There are also artificial ways of sampling. And um, as part of my PhD thesis, I used artificial samplers. And they were like, you know, there's these are the scrubbers that you use in your kitchen to scrub pots and pans. And I had four of those together on a like a, a rock pitot, a nail, a big nail. And I knocked those into rock subtidal rock substrates, which are like 12, 12 to 15 below the water and they acted as collectors. So you can also do artificial collectors because whatever is going to settle on the um, rock over a particular period of time is going to settle on your artificial substrate as it So in terms of sampling the marine environment, there's an array of things people, uh, students in their um, essays mention, trolls, sledges, seams, nets, all that sort of thing. So we have a good idea about it. Um, when we come into the lab, you will be looking at organisms which are quite different in terms of their body types, their shapes, their sizes. Um, we will see, hopefully, an array of different um, taxonomic groups. We will see polychaetes, we will see crustaceans, we will see, uh, well, of course, arthropods, mollusks, bivalves, and so on. They, hopefully, in some of our samples, we've picked up quite a few of the taxonomic groups. So we will be looking at them, and we will also be looking at their different body types. So you have to then try, and within the lab session, you will be asked about making comments like that on the, their body shapes, their sizes, how they're feeding, and so on. But remember, we started by saying these are organisms that are living generally in, in the sediment. Some of them are the crawlers and creepers on the sediment, the epifauna, but the infauna ones then, like the polychaetes and so, where do you think they're going to get their food from? How do they feed? Hmm? How are these organisms living in the sediment? How are they feeding? No answers, not waking up this morning. Okay, they could be sifting sediment, you know from your biology, uh, organisms that feed on sediment and then they're sort of sifting the organic material from the sediment, okay? Um, I have had a couple of slides with the actual process, but I know that you will remember what you did on the boat when you collected the sediment, you put it in the bucket, it was put in the bucket, the bucket was then, you, you sifted it through the mesh and then what was left on the mesh, you washed into that plastic container and you stained it. Why do we stain it? Easily, you can easily pick them out because it, the rose petal stains the proteinaceous material. And then we preserve. Why do we preserve? Why do we always preserve? Why do we preserve? Because we want to look at it in another two weeks' time. Okay, so we need to preserve, or else it's going to all rot because it's okay. It's like its material. Okay, and then and then when we get to the lab, we're going to try to identify. The good thing about benthic samples or biological samples when you collect them and you preserve them is they can stay for a long time. How many people have been to the museum? Well, the rest of you really need to go to the museum. That's sort of two doors down the road from here. You must go to the museum. It is a fantastic museum. It really is very, very good, and you must go to it. And the reason we have so many good specimens is, of course, people like us, all the researchers, anybody who goes out and they collect, we, we put it in, we, uh, we preserve, we label accurately, and then eventually, someone who comes around, where we always have visiting scientists who will say, oh, I want to look at all your inputs, uh, you know, all your crabs, I want to look at all the um, mice, I want to look at all the amphipods, and that's how we get a lot of taxonomic work done, because it's 
it costs a lot of money to get taxonomy done. It's not very easy, and it's actually uh, a specialty that's going out of style because it's got a lot of effort that goes into identification of species. Some of us have done it, so I'm actually a, a polyphene group expert. Um, I work with both polyphenes and nematodes. So I know it's boring and it's a long time you spend doing it, and it's a lot of years. And imagine doing a whole PhD on, on that. But it's interesting, okay, because as I mentioned, it tells you a lot about the conditions of the environment. So looking at these shell, the you know, bivalves, the crustacea, you can choose your group. You may not like worms, but you may like the bivalves, you may like mussels, you may like crabs, you may like lobsters. So it just depends on which group you're looking at. So there's a variety of things to do. And as a little, and a little aside here, it's good in terms of careers. Um, you, you know we're right now Trinidad is actually preparing its biodiversity report, its national biodiversity report. And as always, and of course I contribute to that in terms of marine biodiversity. Um, on the campus we don't really have a lot of marine because we don't have a marine biology department as such. Uh, Mona has a marine department and uh, Bob Cave has a coastal zone department. So a lot of people go to Cave Hill or Mona if they want to do anything um, further, like a major in marine biology or marine ecology. We do have the Institute of Marine Affairs in Chagra, that's where you went, of course, and you visited, and you know what it's all about. So a lot of the marine research for Trinidad has been done there, carried on there with visiting scientists as well as local scientists. So career-wise, as I mentioned, there is a whole open avenue of what can I do. Um, you know, we don't know enough about our marine biodiversity. We don't market it enough. So that was just an aside to get you interested in marine biodiversity and so on. So when we get into the lab, I've got nice pictures I would have showed you that you might have seen some bivalves, some amphipods, the nice worms which we will see. And on the next sort of four slides following, um, we, I talk about parallel communities. Um, what do we mean by parallel communities? When we come into the lab, when we come into the lab, we will be identifying benthic organisms. We will try, just as we did, we had our nice plankton book out and we were able to recognize, um, we had a nice arrow rule, we had um, diatoms, we had dinoflagellates, we had different shapes and so on. The same for the benthic organisms. When we're going to do samples, we're going to be making up a species list, okay? And we will hopefully have a fairly nice list of the different species that we get in our sediment samples and we are hoping to see differences between stations and between groups. Very often what you have is when you compare samples from temperate systems and tropical systems, uh, we recognize over the years that there is a real, there's a similar pattern in terms of dominant organisms. And what happens is that we try to give these uh, communities Needs. So, for example, depending on the type of community we manage to sample or have sample in that Chagaramas area, it may be um, we have a bivalve that's dominant and the polychaete, or just a bivalve with little or nothing else, or a polychaete worm, that's the analyst, a polychaete worm with nothing else dominant, or they're equal, you find we have similar numbers of bivalves or other types of crustaceans, and similar numbers of polychaetes. So when in your reading, and so when you, when you look at uh, what we call parallel communities, and it was uh, done very early on by a scientist called Peterson, he noticed it that in different geographical locations, um, when you collect samples in the, let's say, the same sort of way or a standard sampling methodology, you collect these samples and you analyze them, more often than not, there is that sort of dominant grouping that's associated with sediment from a particular area. 
So it's very interesting uh, that so you can go to a tropical uh, temperate system. We can go to, let's say, the south southwest of England. We can sample in Trinidad or in Tobago. Similar types of environments, meaning similar types of sediments, using the same sample equipment and so on, same methods of analysis, and we are more than likely going to get what we call parallel communities. Okay? And we can often pick those up. These organisms are living in the sediment, as I said, for the past. are good indicators of the environment. But in their sort of spending time here, there are a number of factors that affect them. Remember in this course, we are looking at, we started with the water column. We looked at, we're talking about phytoplankton and zooplankton. Now we're talking about these organisms that are living in the sediment. And we always have to think about how do conditions affect the they live in. So we're talking about conditions. And what sorts of things do you expect are going to influence these organisms? Um, wave motion, turbulence, oxygen, salinity. Okay? So you have to think about those parameters and in the in the slide I deal with it. Um, in terms of turbulence, yes to an extent where it's a shallow benthic surface. So for example, let's think about um, the Baikal Martin River, for example. Uh, some of you probably know it, or any river that you know fairly well. Let's say there's a lot of flooding, a uh, lot of water going out. Do you think that's going to interfere with these sediments, the, the benthic organisms? Yes, because it's a lot more movement, all right? And then what can happen is there can be a lot of turbulence here, and stirring up the sediment. So some of the organisms may get thrown up into the water column and then when everything settles back down, they settle down. Um, oxygen that's trapped in the sediment can become critical. So if you have, remember when we, uh, if you talk, if you, if we talk about say, when the sediment gets very anoxic, where there's a lot of organic material, then your organisms, remember they rely on oxygen in the sediment, so they can die. Uh, when it comes to salinity, yes, salinity affects benthic organisms. Again, as we talked in the estuary, um, in that area, there are, we didn't collect um, from the estuary at the mouth of the river, but there are benthic sediments there, and so there will be benthic organisms associated, and therefore, again, when you have excessive flooding coming off of the land, you're going to then have organisms in the river mouth that are then in an area where the sediment is going to go as low as, you remember what I said, um, it goes to as low as the Gulf of Paria. Normal seawater is what? In terms of salinity? 35 parts per thousand. And in the Gulf of Paria, we go to as low during the wet season, as low as 60 parts per thousand, but generally we have sort of 30, 32, okay, and 35 in the open ocean. So if there's any uh, severe change in terms of salinity, your benefit organism will be affected and your community. Uh, light penetration in terms of, remember, they, they will rely on plankton. Some of these organisms are relying on plankton for food and all those, um, all the bits you spoke about in the scrub class where we talk about plankton. So if there's high plankton productivity, then all the likely you're going to get high benthic productivity. Um, and apart from plankton, I also mentioned to you that there are certain coastal areas like mangroves and wetlands. Remember when we talked about um, these primary producers? If you have the mangroves that are also contributing um, this organic material and productivity as it were and, the, and coral reefs and so dead cane material is going to be transported, it's 
the water we're talking about and therefore all of that material um, is going to drop to the bottom of the ocean and that's what the dissolvers are feeding on. So if you have high productivity um, mangrove area, high productivity coral reef area, then you expect that your, uh, your benefit communities in the proximal or area that is close by is also going to be quite high because there is a sufficient amount of food. So having described then some of the conditions, hopefully you can understand why it becomes quite critical to look at these benthic organisms or to evaluate and assess the types of organisms living in sediments where, for example, as I mentioned, if you have an oil spill, so if you have an oil spill, or we have um, high concentrations of sewage and pollution and so on, all the other things, all the other nasty chemicals and so on. Um, you can imagine then that these, these factors are going to impact severely on your benefit communities. They do impact on water because of course if you have any of these point source pollution let's say, coming into, it will come, let's say, by a drain or some sort of um, outflow. So a drain, all right, and where does it eventually end up? When you wash your dishes in your sink, when you shower, where does all of that water go? Eventually it goes to the sea, okay? So it all meets up and all ends up in the sea. And what's in the sea? Out where Shagram is where we work, the river um, that comes out there by Carnage, that comes out there by Shagram is made south, La Quesa River. All of those rivers are bringing all of the effluents from land, or the runoff from land, into the sea. And who's living off all of these nice things that are being brought into the sea? Our benthic organisms. And that's how this business about it being the bottom of the food chain is that your crabs, your shrimp, everybody who is eating these sediment. Remember, I'm sure you've seen DVDs and videos where you see fish picking off of the sediment, and you will see that in the other videos that we're showing. They are feeding on these organisms, and therefore that's how, to a large extent, um, contaminants and pollutants get transported up the food chain. So we have interesting projects within our department, like people, um, like students, sampling um, oysters and sampling fish and trying to measure concentrations of heavy metals and things like that. All of these contaminants that are coming off the land and that can be trans uh, transported up the food chain because who eventually eats all the fish and the mussels and the shrimp and so on? We eat. Okay? So that's why benthic organisms become quite important in terms of our understanding um, what we call community structure of these organisms. Okay, so benthic communities, how the structure of the community operates in that they are able to interact with each other. Um, yeah, I'm just going to quickly flip through these because I, oh, but I, no, I won't go into the microphone lecture today. Okay, in terms of, so we know that they are good indicators of environmental quality, so they are good for evaluations and assessments. And we will be doing counts when we get to the lab, just like we did with the phytoplankton, because we are doing what we call a quantitative study. Because we want to basically be able to compare and evaluate the productivity per unit area. Now, when we collect it, when we use the graph, I think we said that graph is a one-tenth of a meter squared graph. How many graphs did you use per um, sample? Or you catch, you did three samples, right? So you did three samples, and each of those were roughly about a tenth of a meter squared. So when you get into the lab, you'll be doing this times two. So you're going to be saying the volume of sediment then will be three tenths of a meter squared, basically. Yes? Because
because you, you love to get together. Um, we don't love to get until we actually identify it. So the number of organisms that you get, all right, the number, first of all, of species, and the actual numbers of individuals, because they're going to be different. That actual number, we will then see that's the number per three tenths of a meter square. Yes? So then we can work out what it will be per meter square. So when we are working out or evaluating, when we're doing quantitative studies, we want to evaluate this. Remember, I talked about the productivity per unit area. So this is how we're going to do it. So when you come into the lab next week, so the following Wednesday, we will be working out the productivity per unit area. Okay? And then we will do that comparison with uh, the phytoplankton productivity as well as water quality parameters so that you give a nice um, complementary, e complementary picture in terms of all complements together. And we will get a good idea of what is really happening in that Chagrama's bay. Based on what I've said here, as you can imagine, if you have, ex let's say we have extremely high um, oil concentrations, let's say we have extremely high uh, hydrocarbon concentrations in this area, for example, do you expect to have a lot of organisms or very few organisms? What do you think? Hmm? Fewer or a lot? Fewer, yeah, because oil, as we know, is toxic in part. Um, it can actually form a slick, so it can probably it can cover them over. Um, do you recall the BP oil spill? Um, last year, was it? Or two years ago? Yes. Uh, about two years ago now. If you take some time, go back and look at it, and you will see that a lot of the uh, marine organisms were totally covered over. And especially when it comes to like birds and so that's that you know that's part of their mechanism of um, you know transfer putting oxygen through their system and so on and they will die. They will be covered and smothered. So a lot of the toxicity, well a lot of the actual causing death to benthic organisms and other marine organisms of oil in water is that it's either directly can be smothering and top down. They could directly smaller them and therefore they won't get any oxygen and they die. Or it can also be it's toxic. Okay? And then oil when it's weathered, it gives different it's different properties and so on. So this is why they are really quite important and it's important to understand what where where they are and how they're adapted for living there as well. Um, we also have one of the slides where we talk about, in terms of community structure, we talk about trophic relationships. And trophic division. And this is basically, um, I mean, you know what these are from your sort of basic biology. It's the different feeding types. So, Pay attention to the handout before you come into the lab. Um, the next time that we see, we, we meet in the lab. Because what you need to do is to understand the different groups, the taxonomic groups. How are they all feeding and living in this particular environment? Okay? Are they going to be filter feeders living in there? Are they only going to be carnivores? Are they going to be herbivores? Okay, how do they operate in that environment? And that's what part of understanding the uh, ecosystem itself, because we are looking at the benthic ecosystem, we need to understand how the organisms are interacting with each other. So when we get into the lab and we start to make up our species list, we will then have to go into our background reading. You won't have that in the lab, but in your write-up, and that's why I mentioned it's a good idea to come prepared to the lab because you want to be able to discuss something about their trophic relationships. So you will know the taxonomic groups that we're expecting based on this PowerPoint presentation. We are expecting analytic groups, we are expecting arthropods, we are expecting 
uh, gastropods and so on. So you need to look and do some work before you get into the lab about the different taxonomic groups. So benthic organisms, as I said, they are good evaluators or integrators of the environment. Um, they also tell us a lot about our biodiversity. Uh, when I was talking about careers to you a few minutes ago, I mentioned the different kinds of research projects that you can do and the different contributions it makes to biodiversity. And as you know, I'm sure from your reading, and I keep reminding you that you have got to do a fair amount of reading on your own, um, understanding and recognizing our biodiversity is quite important. And I did start uh, when we talk about the museum by saying that you will find that actually say it, but you will find that there are less of the, we have less of our marine fauna represented in the museum. And that's because we don't have, as I said, a big marine um, system um, biodiversity group here. But understanding marine biodiversity is, um, and working on it, is, takes quite a lot of effort. Um, you could actually spend a whole day, a whole week working on one single organism trying to find a name for it. So it's not very easy, but it does provide us with a lot of information. And as I mentioned, some of us in the um, university here, myself and Professor Egan, we are very lucky to have been people who worked on individual groups. So we have a, a list of our papers upstairs, if ever you're interested online as well. We have some of our taxonomic papers. So the point I'm making to you is that it is a wide open field and you can choose any group basically. You can say, oh I think I like sponges or I think I like um, sea urchins and there's a lot, a lot of work for you to do in the marine field. So that's really just to get you into it. Um, then a lot of these organisms you can actually also, again in terms of uh, business. It's good to culture a lot of these benthic invertebrates for aquariums because so, a lot of fish food, as you know, that we, a lot of uh, fish food for Trinidad today, we import it. And what is fish food? Fish food is, you know, either invertebrates that are culture or it's actually trash fish that you crush up and so on. So that's another business venture that you could think about in terms of uh, how these benthic organisms are quite important. Um, they also, you could culture them and you could then do aquaculture. In some uh, countries like Scotland and um, I think it's somewhere, I think on the west coast of, um, of the states as well, they actually culture or cultivate the, like the chip chip for example, that we grab from areas from biology. Anybody? No? Okay, there is, uh, is an errant uh, polychaete that could get quite large as well, and that's actually being cultured or cultivated, at, uh, what do you call aquaculture, cultivation, for sale for as live bait. So I'm just giving you there some nice ideas of that they're nice to look at under the microscope, but they're also quite important as well. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to ask you then to continue reading those, uh, your reader's slide together with the background information, all the other resource material that you have, and remember to start making the connections because during your, uh, for your final exams, you're hardly going to get a question that is saying, you know, as one can you tell me everything you know about benthic communities now. It may ask you to think about a relationship, for example, between benthic communities and the phytoplankton. So you really have to start attempting to make those kinds of connections. Don't think about the lectures as being discrete topics that, you know, that's kind of how it's going to come on a final exam. Remember that you have to think about the relationships between the different topics and of course the, with, um, within and outside of the different areas. Okay, so have a good um, week. So I, I'm not going to see you for the week, but I urge you to turn up for the coral reef lectures and the DVD. Okay? So take care, have a good weekend.